Good morning. Thank you for being here today. It's the right place to be. That goes along with the sermon. It's the right place to be. Where else would you be? There's a lot of places you could be. But God would have us to be gathered together, called out, and assembled. I heard... Someone say one time, it was uh, Rhodes Davis's wife, Cindy. I heard her say, help people bloom where they're planted. And I, was, I had thought when I heard that, wow, she is so wise. Help people bloom where they are planted. That, just, that is sage advice. What a very wise woman. I, I learned later that it, it was actually, a, it's a common or it is a, an older saying than her. And she was repeating it. doesn't make her less wise, but to give proper credit, help people bloom where they are planted. I had a conversation um, while COVID uh, was making changes, we'll go with. I was discussing with other preachers and even a preacher who had stopped preaching to, to do something else. Like, How do you know you're in the right spot when you're preaching? And the answer was, that, that came back was, God doesn't care. Sometimes God doesn't care. Sometimes you're in the bright spot or the wrong spot, and no matter where you are, if you are working what you are supposed to be working, God will use you wherever you are. That brings us to this morning's message. You are the right person, you are in the right place, and it is the right time. This lesson comes from Esther. Esther is told that, so if you wanted to go to the book of Esther, we will start with her story. The people in Esther are distressed. There are going to be some common themes that get repeated throughout these stories this morning of these uh, people that have lived in history. In Esther, the Jews are under distress. Mordecai has made Haman mad. Haman is a, a, one of the king's officials, and he, Haman, decides the best way to get rid of somebody you don't like is to kill them, so I will have him killed. It's not enough to have uh, Mordecai killed. I want all the Jews eradicated. And so he works with the king to have the king allow everyone in the kingdom to create, c commit genocide against the Jews. Mordecai goes to Esther and says, you need to do something about this. You need to go before the king. And what Esther's reply is, is that I'm not in a position to help. I'm not in the right spot to help. I'm on the outside. See, if anybody goes before the king while they're not invited, they are... And that's not the best place for my head. It should stay on my shoulders. I haven't been called before the king these 30 days, is her reply. What Mordecai tells her is that deliverance will come because the Lord will deliver his people. You can be a part of it, or you might not be a part of it. But deliverance will come. And so he gives the line that brings up the lesson for and the, the message for us to hear today. Who knows whether you have who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. The Lord is doing many things throughout this world. Some of them we consider awesome, and some of them we might not consider to be so great. Either way, whichever whichever thing it is that he's doing, it's to bring about his glory. Sometimes through glorifying people and sometimes through humbling them for all things will glorify the Lord. This is what Mordecai points out. The Lord's going to do what he's going to do. You can be a part of this or not. You can help or not. You can do what is beneficial and you can be a part of God empowering his people, saving his people. Or you can sit on the sidelines and do nothing. It will be to your detriment. So her response is, then I need time. You go and fast, I will take my uh, entourage and we will fast. We will prepare ourselves and then we will go before the king. 
Deliverance does come. The entire household of Haman is given into the hand of Queen Esther and they are put to death. All of the Jews are allowed to defend themselves and they eradicate those who hate them. As it's written that they are defending themselves against those who hate them. And then Esther becomes a blessing to all of the people of the Jews. It's through her the power of God works and that the people are saved. They even come up with the Feast of Purim that we talked about this morning in Bible class a, a little bit. That every year, and this is one of the things that is, is, is very special. There are times when the Jewish people are supposed to lament and mourn. They're supposed to be unclean and, and ceremonially not in a right relationship with God. And in this feast that is set up, the Feast of Purim, because it is deliverance from God, the decree that goes out, the obligation that they take is that no matter what they are doing, no matter what's going on in their lives, they will stop doing that and rejoice for the deliverance of the Lord. Your spouse has just died, and tomorrow is Purim. And you won't mourn your spouse starting tomorrow because of Purim. Because of the deliverance of the Lord. There is a negative thing that has happened. There is an uncleanness. There is something going on. And all of that gets set aside to remember the deliverance of the Lord. That is brought about through Esther going to the king. Because that's what she had been brought there for. She was not the right person to start with. She was not in the right place. She was not allowed to come before the king. And yet because she worked as Mordecai had suggested, toward the deliverance of God's people, she is a blessing for them. Moses. As the book of Exodus starts, the people, uh, the, the family of Joseph has grown. All of the family of Israel has come down to Egypt. They've lived there for 400 some years and they have become a mighty people huge group and they have been enslaved by the pharaoh the king of egypt and so the cry of their slavery comes up before god god hears them and is intent on delivering them so he visits a shepherd in a burning bush and says come on i'm going to send you to pharaoh you're going to Go before him and sing, let my people go. Sure, it happened just like that. Now, if you'll flip over to Acts chapter 7, where Stephen is being stoned, or is going to be stoned, and part of the sermon that he gives, he points out that 40 years, Moses lived among the Egyptians as a child of the king's daughter. <coughs> For 40 years, he's been out in the wilderness tending sheep and raising sheep. And so he's 80 years old when God finally comes to him and says, you need to go sing, you need to go talk to Pharaoh, and I'm going to give you the ability to do amazing things. Five times Moses argues <coughs> with God, don't send me. I'm the wrong person. You don't want me. And finally the Lord gets angry with him and says, fine, take your brother with you. You will talk to your brother. He will talk to Pharaoh. And they will let my people go. This is exactly how it happens. And ten plagues later, the Pharaoh calls up Moses in the middle of the night and says, go away and bless me too. This is effectively dad yelling at the child as they leave. Remember to check the oil. You have to leave here. Up. Go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said. Be gone. And bless me too. You've just ravaged the entire country. You're going to take huge amounts of gold and, and silver and, and goods with you. Remember to bless me too. And so the people are delivered out of Egyptian bondage. 
To come to the New Testament through many other examples that we could look at, remember the one that I had written down I, I used last week with Amaziah saying to Amos, you don't belong here. And then Amos says, I didn't belong here, but God brought me here. And so here I am. Let me tell you what God had to say. And since I had to not use that, since I used it last week, we'll look at Paul. The Gentiles are not the ones who Christ came to. In fact, a Gentile woman comes to Christ and asks for help, and he says, I have not been sent to you, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she argues with him for help. The Gentiles have not been given the message of salvation. And so it's rejoiced over in Acts chapter 11 whenever the previous chapter points out that the Holy Spirit has fallen on Cornelius' household. You can be saved as Gentiles. And so the church rejoices over this that God has brought the message of salvation to them. Paul's not in the right place to preach it though. He points out to Timothy, his protege, there was a time when I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent. He also points out to him, I wasn't born at the right time. I was born out of due season in some translations. I was untimely born in certain translations. He basically said, I didn't grow up at the right era. Simon Peter grew up at the right time. He was the right age for when Jesus came to do his ministry. But here it's been a decade. It's been some time since Jesus is gone. I, I wasn't born at the right time to be a follower of his. I was in the wrong spot. I was called out of the appropriate time. And yet, he does point out he was called. In discussing what he was doing, because he wasn't in the right place, an insolent opponent, people were put to death. And he cast his vote. So stop just a minute. And think about being the mama whose boy was voted against. And now you want to listen to Paul preach? You voted and then my son was stoned. You voted. You held the coats and my boy was killed. You are the one who is opposed to killing my family. The way of Jesus the Christ. And now you want to preach he may be the most out-of-place individual, or at least he portrays himself to be close to that. How many Christians were put to death because before Paul was commissioned by Christ? And yet in Galatians chapter 2, we're told that it was him who was entrusted with the message to, to the Gentiles. And we've just finished up going through the book of Acts on Sunday morning where Paul goes on this missionary journey to discuss salvation with this many people, and then he does it in reverse the next time to save that many more people. And then a third time he goes like this to save more people. And history would tell us, even though the Bible stops in Acts chapter 28, that he probably goes to Spain on another missionary journey to save even more people. And whether he does or not, I'm going to quote from you and already have his writings this morning. It's the one that's on the board. He wrote that. To save Gentiles, of which that's all of us. And still doing it. The word of God still effective off of his pen. And yet one of the things that he points out is there was something that was bothering me the whole time. At least two times, he's told where to go. Once to Macedonia, and then again later that he's told he will go to Rome. He's in the wrong spot. And what he winds up saying at the end is, I don't care who preaches as long as there's preaching being done. 
Wherever I'm called to, whether it's to Macedonia, to Rome, to Spain, back to Jer- Jerusalem itself, as long as someone is preaching and they're preaching salvation to people, let it be done. Whether it's Timothy or whether it's Titus who have been set up in these locations to, to manage, to, to work with these churches or not, preach the salvation of Jesus Christ. Just let it be done. Let the glory go to God in every way, whether in pretense or in truth. Whatever it is, as long as Christ is being proclaimed, let it be done. None of these were the right people. Have you noticed? Esther is a queen. All of the right people of the Jews had gone back to Jerusalem. She's a leftover. She did not find it necessary to go back to Jerusalem whenever those who were deported were allowed to go. She didn't think it was worth her time. Or for whatever reason, she didn't go. You would think all of the zealous, because that's what you're told, all of the zealous Jews did. Yet she won a, we'll go with because of the mixed company, she won a beauty contest to be a queen. She's not the right person. It wasn't the right time because the king had not called for her. She wasn't allowed to go before the king. And yet that's exactly why she was put in the place that she was put. Because she was the right person. Because God selected her. Because she was in the right place because that's where God had placed her. And it was the right time because it was time for it to happen and she could do it. Moses had been in Egypt for 40 years in the house of Pharaoh. Grew up at his table eating his food. That wasn't right. He needs to go learn how to chase sheep around mountainsides in the middle of nowhere and then God calls him. He's not the right person. He's a murderer. He's not in the right place. He's in the land of Midian. But he's exactly who sees the fire coming from the burning bush and is told, you need to go sing, let my people go. You need to go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. He's not the right person. Except that by God, he is the right person in the right place, and it's time for him to work. Paul is the last person that many Christians will want to associate with, and it will take years for another man named Barnabas, son of encouragement, to walk around with his arm around Paul saying, it's okay, you don't have to be afraid of him. He's a good bumble now. He's a good person now. You're welcome. Paul's not the right person except that by God he is exactly who God calls. Actually, Jesus appears to on the way to Damascus and says, stop fighting against where I'm pointing you to. Or isn't it hard for you to kick against the goads? He is exactly the right person. He has been born untimely so that the Jews could receive the message of salvation. And when that was completed, now he's in the right place at the right time to deliver the message so that he could be martyred much later for the salvation that's been proclaimed. So the point of the whole message, the point of looking at all three of these individuals is to point out You will never consider yourself, or it's possible, you will never consider yourself to be the right person. You don't know enough Bible. You haven't spent enough time studying it. You don't have the conditions exactly the way that you would be more comfortable with. You didn't get to enter into the conversation from the direction that you like to enter into that conversation. You may never consider yourself the right person, and you are exactly who God has chosen to be his child and to take his message to someone else. You are the right person because you're a child of God. There may be a better place. There might be a more clean kitchen table. The dessert that you fixed to go with this Bible class that you have in your home could have been a better one. 
or a different one, or the living room may have been cleaner, or I might have wanted it around a kitchen table, but the discussion that I'm having is in a gas station at a gas pump. It might never be the right time for you to have the conversation with someone about their salvation, according to you. And yet, any time and any place where you are able to glorify God and bring salvation to someone else, it's the right time. And it's the right place. The Word of God does not come back empty. It's going to accomplish what it is set out to do. You're a middleman. And as a middleman, all you have to do is get out of the way. You are the right person. You can help people bloom where they're planted. Is it time for you to step up and do more? <coughs> Consider that we can let so many things get in our way. The king hasn't called for me. I'm a murderer back in Egypt. I've helped kill Christians here. We come up with whatever excuse we want to. But if we'll put that down and see that God has been using the wrong people in the wrong places at the wrong times the entire history of doing His will. Paul says, I'm given this thorn out of conceit. And at the end of that exchange, he says, it's when I'm weak that I'm strong. It's when I put myself out of the way and let God shine that it happens. It's going to be difficult for you to bring deliverance to others until you can see that God can make a nobody, a wrong person by our standards, a huge blessing to whole groups of people. We would have never chosen these guys, these gals, to do this job. We may never choose ourselves. What a detriment that will be to those around us. You are the right person. You're in the right place. And it's time that we recognize what Jesus said when he was here. The fields are white for harvest. We just need somebody to go out there and get to work. All of these examples could easily say, just as all of these examples could easily see themselves as outside the problem. They all could see, easily justify keeping their distance from the problem. And they all had something to lose by becoming involved in God's plan to fix the problem. And they all stepped up and answered the call to rescue the perishing. If there's anything that you need to do to get yourself out of the way, an answer that you need to give to God or make your life right, make it known this morning as we stand and sing.